Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. Today we have a manga review of chapter 933, A Samurai's Mercy. And after the build up of last week, what we have here is a wonderfully chaotic payoff full of action, comedy, and one pretty damn big shock. So we'll go ahead and start with that because why not? Komorosaki sliced up by Kyoshiro. So first of all, I really like this turn of events, not because I enjoyed seeing Komorosaki struck down, but because it was so unexpected and because it really does a lot to build the character of Kyoshiro. Every chapter this guy is in intrigues me more and more. And there's a particular panel during this chapter where after cutting Komorosaki, we have a close up of him with a blood stain on his cheek and he's just smiling like an absolute demon. It's fearsome as hell, and it's a great contrast to the reaction of Orochi, who even in his devil fruit form, looks like a complete derp. I've said this before, but I'm really hoping that Kyoshiro is the villainous presence we've been lacking on Wano, outside of the Beast Pirates, that is. And he leaves us on a very mysterious note this week, as he finds Kinemon's message that it would seem was being held by Komorosaki. Now there's still two different schools of thought happening here. The first is that Kyoshiro is secretly working for the protagonists, in which case he would certainly hide this message and perhaps even go to great lengths to fake Komorosaki's death. And the whole death thing is a discussion we'll get into in a little bit. But the second thought is that he is more or less the ultimate samurai antagonist of this arc and that he is actively working to supplant Orochi. In which case, hiding the message still makes sense because he could make use of the chaos of the incoming attack to swiftly remove Orochi from power and, you know, claim that it was that pesky Kozuki clan. Oh, what a tragedy. Oh dear. But all right, on to Komorosaki. Firstly, she had a brilliant line right at the beginning of the chapter stating to Orochi that the first one to fall in love is the one who loses. Essentially spitting right in his numerous dragony faces. That was powerful stuff and it's always great to see someone proudly standing their ground when faced with imminent death. And that's one reason why I would support the idea of Komorosaki dying right here and now. It's a fantastic ending. And once again, we are almost certainly going to get a flashback featuring her in some form that just like her playing of the Shamisen will make this moment even more impactful and tragic, if indeed she did perish here. Because the issue is that it's just so hard to see her dying here. Too much of her character feels unfinished and she's essentially the only candidate thus far who could be Hiyori. But I mean, at the same time, she could still be Hiyori and have some kind of arrangement with Kyoshiro where her death furthers both of their desires. I just, I don't know about this one. Everything I know about One Piece tells me that there's an overwhelming chance of her being alive, but I also really want Oda to be capable of pulling off a move as ballsy as this. It would be almost Tarantino-esque, really. Introduce a new character, build her up as someone exceptionally important and kill her off anyway, only for the true tragedy of her being to be revealed later down the line. Well, you know, there's the really left field thought that because this arc has a whole time travel element to it, that all of these tragic events could happen and then we could just go back and like try to fix it. Say perhaps the assault on Onigashima fails spectacularly, and then somehow we now have to go back to the start of the arc and play things out a bit differently. I mean, nothing is out of the question right now. That's how crazy Wano is. Speaking of questions, there is no longer one surrounding Orochi's Devil Fruit, because it was finally revealed and it is a heavy heavy no me. So it's actually from the same family as the Boa sisters, Marigold and Santa Sonia's fruits. That's interesting because I think most of us were definitely expecting it to be another dragon type Zoan rather than a snake, which you know, you'd absolutely be forgiven for because the heads look like Eastern dragons. Alas, this is a mythical Zoan and when it comes to those, the rules essentially go out the window. As for the other chaotic moments during the banquet, my favorite portion was anything Brooke was involved in. Watching him terrify the Oniwa Banshu was brilliant comedy and very educational as well, as I have recently learned that the starving skeleton is indeed a thing in Japanese mythology. Well, more specifically, there's a group of yokai referred to as Gasha Dokuro that take the forms of giant skeletons said to be amassed from the bones of people who have died from starvation or in battle, I think. But it's nice to know that there is some basis for these comic moments and it's not just the Oniwa Banshu being scared by a go Although even if it was just that, you know, it works for me. There was also a pretty funny moment featuring Shinobu, where she was recognized by one of the Oniwa Banshu and began to say fufu. I'm surprised you know. Before being immediately interrupted by him saying that he mistook her for someone else due to her uh, radical change in appearance. And the thing that got me here is really simple. It's the placement of the speech bubbles. So Shinobu starts speaking and then Hanzo's bubble comes in right over the top of it and cuts hers off. And that very simple placement just amplifies the comedy so much for me. I love it. The other thing I love is Nami and Zeus. These two were made for each other. Other. It's nice to see that Nami finally has a level of power that is deserving of a straw hat at this point in the story. She should be able to sow mass amounts of chaos like every other member of the crew. And you know what? With this whole Big Mom amnesia plot, there's every chance that she'll be keeping Zeus for the rest of the series. But speaking of, at the very end of the chapter, we have some great developments in the world of Big Mom. So first up, her amnesia has indeed returned her to the state of a more or less innocent five-year-old child, which is shown when she thanks Suru for giving her food despite her being poor. Very un-Big Mom-like. 
at least not the one we knew on Whole Cake Island. It kind of reminds me of Luffy's first encounter with Tama actually, where even though Luffy only got a single bowl of steamed rice and was nowhere near satisfied by it, he was exceptionally grateful to Tama for providing it. And I bring up that parallel because this chapter made it very clear just how easily I can see Luffy and this incarnation of Big Mom becoming very good friends. They both have that childlike innocence about them and they can bond over food and stuff. As they are now, Big Mom is a very natural ally. And the thought of her and Luffy teaming up to go on some sort of chaotic adventure is extremely exciting. And it looks like they're on a pathway to meeting up quite soon because in light of this big development, Chopper and the others have decided to take her to Udon. And if you're not familiar yet with the general geography of Wano, Udon is the industrialized section of the nation where the prisoner mine is located. So I suspect they plan on using her to break Luffy out, which I would also be incredibly keen to see, especially because Kid is there as well and he would surely lose his shit at the sight of Big Mom. I suppose we should stop calling her that though because it would seem that her official Wano alias is Olin. And look, personally, I was rooting for Big Mom and Osuke, but sure, Olin. Whatever. But look, I don't know if I'm in the minority here, but I'm just incredibly excited for any future developments with this character. I really enjoyed seeing Lin Lin in the flashback on Whole Cake Island, and this could be a big chance for her to reclaim a lost childhood and grow as a character, even after the eventual regaining of her memories. But I do need to point out that a lot of people still dislike this move, and in some cases, dislike is a bit of an understatement, because they see it as making a joke of one of the Yonko, but I feel that for the most part, those people just don't get the character. And there's one particular comment I saw on the origin Jackson spoiler thread that just epitomizes this, which I'll read to you now. But just before I do, I wanna make clear that I'm not trying to make fun of the guy or call him out or embarrass him. I just want to share this as a prevalent thought within certain sectors of the fan base. I don't know where Oda is heading with the Big Mom plot, but if she doesn't impress us by the end of this arc, I might lose a big interest in One Piece as a manga reader. I've trusted and continue to trust Oda as a story writer, but any author with a minimum of common sense knows that you can't make her an emperor and weak enough to ally with Chopper. Please let it be something epic even if I don't see how. And I'm just sitting here like, mate, you don't even see anything as it is. That is legit the appeal of Big Mom's character. The fact that she is a child in the body of quite possibly the strongest human in the world, which makes her volatile and highly unpredictable. Her character has limited intelligence and isn't guided by boring logic or standard stereotypes. And yes, the fact that she can be one of the Yonko and an ally of Chopper, even if it was induced by admittedly questionable amnesia, is what makes her interesting. I mean, what fun is godlike power in the hands of someone actually capable of wielding it perfectly? It's just so much more interesting to watch this incredibly flawed yet highly dangerous character stumble through the world and create further instability. But to be fair, this commenter is far from the only person who feels this way. What happened to Big Mom has definitely been a controversial action, but that's what happens when you pull left field storytelling decisions. And to be clear, I'm not preaching that this is impeccable storytelling by Oda because I still think that the implementation of amnesia is clunky as anything. But as for Big Mom's character, it's not as if anything's changed. And in fact, doing this is probably the only decent way to expand upon her and give us something new after Whole Cake Island. But that's enough on that rant. What I'm getting at is I enjoyed her appearance at the end of the chapter. Yay. And finally, just quickly, I don't usually comment on the cover pages, but this week there is an artwork request featuring Mr. Enel, a character who has been absent from the world of One Piece for far too long in my opinion. It's great to see him drawn with Oda's modern style, even if the request is pretty trippy. Enel and a frog blowing bubbles with bubble gum. Although I think there's a decent explanation for that when we look at the pen name of Hong Kong 420 land. And I'm going to assume that this was most certainly 420 when they decided to make this request. But that pretty much does it for chapter 933. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produces in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. Also do check out my Teespring store if you're interested in shirts, hoodies, and other miscellaneous items with the proceeds going directly to support the channel as well. And if you if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server where a wide array of shenaniganry takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on the chapter. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time.